Good afternoon and welcome to the African American Heritage House and the 2021 CHQ Assembly. My name is Errol Davis and I have the distinct honor and privilege of serving as president of the African American Heritage House here at Chautauqua or AAHH as we fondly refer to it. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this second of 10 lectures that the AAAH will sponsor or co-sponsor along with the institution this season. We are a diverse support organization which is informed by the African American experience. We are committed to strengthening Chautauqua and we do this in a variety of ways. We do it by encouraging and certainly welcoming diversity. We do it by fostering honest conversations such as the Mira Project. And certainly we do it by adding robust new voices to the programmatic mix. Today, as we are all beginning to, I think, sometimes painfully understand, it is important that we own both our past as well as our present. We in the AAHH are committed. We are committed to telling the stories that need to be told. And we will tell them primarily from the perspective of historically marginalized people. I encourage all of our viewers to visit our website, which you see on the screen, aaheritagehouse.org. There you will learn how you can support our efforts and become involved in our work. As we are entirely supported by contributions, I want to thank our many friends and supporters for making both last season as well as this season possible. Without the generosity of our friends and supporters, we would be unable to bring the quality speakers to Chautauqua that we have over the years and are doing so again this season. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you for supporting this valuable work. This week's thematic focus at Chautauqua is on new frontiers, exploring today's unknown. And our speaker today is the Reverend Dr. Heber Brown, community organizer, social entrepreneur, base builder, network weaver, and senior pastor of Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. For nearly two decades, Dr. Brown has been a catalyst for personal transformation and social change. He is the founding director of Orita's Cross Freedom School. This is, they, uh, the Freedom School is based on the Freedom Schools of the 1960s. And Dr. Brown works to reconnect black youth to their African heritage while providing them hands-on learning opportunities to spark their creative genius as well as building vocational skills. Additionally, in 2015, he launched the Black Church Food Security Network, which is a multi-state alliance of congregations working together to inspire health, wealth, and power in the black community. His food network accomplishes this by partnering with historically African-American churches to establish gardens on church-owned land while cultivating partnerships with African-American farmers to create a truly grassroots community-led food system. Dr. Brown's dedication to service has been widely and I think very appropriately recognized. In 2018, Baltimore Magazine named him a visionary of the city and the Baltimore City Office of Civil Rights presented him with their Food Justice Award. In 2019, he received the coveted Emerging Leaders Award from the Clonell Foundation, which brought with it a $250,000 investment in the work of the Black Church Food Security Network. I am truly pleased and honored that he has agreed to share his thoughts with us here today. And I know that you're going to find his remarks both enjoyable and enlightening. However, before we begin today's lecture, our live audience should know that you may submit questions for our live Q&A with Reverend Brown through the submission portal at questions.chq.org, which is on your screen at the moment. And you can do this from any mobile or desktop browser. If you use Twitter, use the hashtag CHQ2021. Today's remarks were pre-recorded. However, they will be followed by a live Q&A with Dr. Brown with questions submitted by our live audience tuning in around the nation. My fellow Chautauquans, the AAHH is pleased to present to you the Reverend Dr. Heber Brown. 11 years ago, I stood in this very spot at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in front of a congregation full of believers and shared with them 
that I was feeling a divine nudge for us to start growing food in the front yard of our church. Admittedly, as excited as I was by the possibilities related to us growing food together, I was also terrified by what I thought their reaction might be to this new idea. You see, I'd never seen up to that point a church with a garden, a garden in its front yard, no less. I grew up seeing churches with well-manicured lawns, with big steeples and stained glass windows. The front yard was almost an extension of the holy living that was being preached about inside. Church lawns were not for growing food. It's probably a position that I would have agreed with before then, but the problem was that at that time, I was seeing a disturbing pattern amongst the members of the congregation that I served. I saw a pattern of them going in and out of the hospital for diet-related health issues. It was a cluster of the same members going in and out of the hospital. Extending care to them meant doing what seminary trained me to do. I knew to go in and pray with them in the hospital. I knew it meant me in sharing an encouraging scripture and an uplifting word. However, after seeing these members go in and out, in and out of the hospital over and over again, I began to become uneasy with just doing what I was trained to do for them and leaving it there. Isn't there something more that can be done, I thought? There's got to be a way that I can help put a halt to their unmerry go round with diet-related illnesses. Then I had an idea. If the lack of nutrient-rich food was involved in their illness, then in my mind, connecting them with nutrient-rich food for their bodies could be a part of the medicine. That's what I thought. My initial idea was to partner with a grocer or food store to help pipeline the fresh produce from their store to our congregation. Thankfully, there was a fresh food market right across the main intersection by our church. I still remember the day when I walked over to the store with a mind to talk to whoever was in charge and explore partnership possibilities. Before getting to the supervisor's office, however, I decided to walk through their aisles and get a closer look at their produce. Their items looked all well and good, but when I looked at their prices of what they had, I experienced sticker shock. I could not believe how expensive their produce was. There was no way that I or the members of the congregation that I serve would be able to make this store, the store closest to our church, the home base for our physical health. After the shock wore off, then the anger came. I got angry because I thought about our members, people who I know and love, who were sick and facing many challenges because of food-related issues. It was so frustrating to me to see the food we needed in order to be healthy right there at our fingertips. But the economic and cultural barriers prevented us from obtaining it. I stormed out of the store that day without talking to the supervisor. You see, I didn't go to that store seeking charity or pity. My pride and dignity would not let me grovel for that which I believed was a human right. I decided to leave the store and come back 
to the church. And as I walked, I was so angry. I was angry about the fact that what we needed was there, but not able to be obtained by me and the members of that congregation. I left from that store. I walked back to this church, and I was heated. I got near the front door, and that's when I had an epiphany. God interrupted my holy hissy fit and asked, what's wrong, Heber? I said, God, you know what's wrong. The food that we need to live abundantly is right at our fingertips, and we cannot obtain it. Nearing the front door of our church building, the divine conversation continued. God said, Heber, look to your right. When I looked, I saw a piece of our front yard that had no enduring purpose in the life of our church and frankly was easy to overlook. There was nothing dynamic about this patch of land. I had walked past it hundreds of times by then and thought nothing of it. But on that day, when God said, look at it again, I began to see a vision take hold of this land. I saw a vision of a garden and a church made more healthy because of its commitment to grow its own food. I heard God that day say, Heber, what do you have in your hand? Land, God, we have land. So I stood before the congregation in April of 2010 and declared that I had heard the voice of God, not telling us to build a bigger church or erect a steeple, but rather to use the land that we owned to start growing what we needed. If we can't afford what they have, I told myself, let's use what we have and grow what we need. That began our story of growing food at Pleasant Hope Baptist Church here in Baltimore, Maryland. We worked together to transform 1,500 square feet of our front yard into a vegetable garden that grows kale and beets and okra, peppers, strawberries, blackberries, figs, broccoli, tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, and so much more. In those early years especially, we were growing 1,200 pounds of produce on 1,500 square feet of land. Not a whole lot of land, but a whole lot of food that could help members of our congregation. One of the surprises that I experienced along the way was related to the significance of elders to this project. I thought that it would be the young adults who helped me to do the early heavy lifting at that point. After all, at that time, I was a young adult pastor with a revolutionary fire for social justice and building power for black people. Surely, I thought, the young adults will see the vision and get involved to help get it going in the, in the beginning. The young adults did come out when we launched that garden here at Pleasant Hope. They were there taking pictures and selfies all over the land. But after that first day, most of the younger folks were nowhere to be found. But do you know who didn't leave? The seniors of the church. I called them the AARP Club. Many of them stayed and tended to the weekly needs of our church's new garden. Chief among them was Sister Maxine Nicholas. I was already familiar with Sister Maxine in our church. You couldn't miss her. She was one of the mothers of the congregation and a pillar in the ministry. She was president of the Sanctuary Choir and was known to help out with many other ministries as well. But when I announced the idea to start a garden, 
it presented an opportunity for me and others in our church to see a hidden gift in her that was there the entire time. Sister Maxine Nicholas grew up on a farm with a large family in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina. Growing food was in her blood. She left the South and came North in the 50s like millions of other black folks. She found work here in Baltimore, got married, and joined Pleasant Hope soon after arriving in this city. Though she left the South, the wisdom and experience of the South did not leave her. When we started the garden, all of her farming gifts came to the fore. Though I articulated the vision for us to grow food, it was Sister Maxine who taught us how to do it. I learned under her tutelage and marveled at how much that she knew. She went home to be with the Lord on November 1st, 2018. However, what she taught me is still with me. And the garden that she helped to grow, it still exists, now bearing her name. Maxine's garden is one of the celebrated features of our ministry. And it became the birthing place of another ministry as well. In 2015, during the Baltimore uprising, which occurred after the death of Freddie Gray, while demonstrations, marches, and rallies rocked this city, our phone here at the church office started ringing. People were hungry and in need of food. The corner stores that were near the epicenter of the upheaval were closed. And because our church was known as the Garden Church, people started calling us for help. That moment in 2015 provided an opportunity for another idea that was germinating in my mind to finally sprout. For you see, after seeing all of the success that our one church had experienced with our garden, I began dreaming about what was possible if we applied a systems approach to our individual church's garden story. What if, I thought, we could get more black churches using the land that they already owned to grow the food that we need? What if we could tap into the existing ecosystem of the black church community and help reconnect it with its pre-migration identity? The more agrarian personality that included a closer relationship with land and food would bubble up once more in the church if we could just get closer back to the land. I'd already been thinking and dreaming about this idea, but the Baltimore uprising pushed it out of my head and into the world. When our phones started ringing with people on the other end asking for food, I knew that our garden alone did not have enough. But I was in relationship with some black farmers. I reached out to them and asked if they could help partner with us to feed our people. They readily agreed. And we began doing the work of picking up, processing, and transporting food around Baltimore City, food that came from black farmers. We did this for about two or three weeks, and I realized that the idea that I had for a black-led food system anchored by black churches was happening. We were doing it. We were beginning to feed ourselves. I named this initiative the Black Church Food Security Network. Since that time, the network has grown exponentially and God continues to bless. Other churches have come alongside and joined us from as far west as Omaha, Nebraska, and as far south as Georgia and Alabama. Black farmers from across the country have partnered with us as well. In fact, we now have a black farmer directory on our website where people who want to buy from them can more easily find out where they are. 
the Black Church Food Security Network, has three main programs. Operation Higher Ground is our first program. We work with black churches to help them to start gardens on land that they already own. Now we have churches across Baltimore and all over the nation that have gardens on their land. That's Operation Higher Ground. We also have the Soil to Sanctuary Market. The Soil to Sanctuary Market is like a miniature farmer's market that we bring inside of churches on days when they worship. You know we are hungry after church. So we bring the farmers and the food business owners inside the church building on Sundays so that after the benediction is given, the parishioners can go out into their fellowship hall or multi-purpose room and buy directly from black farmers and black food business owners. And our last program is called the Black Church Supported Agriculture Program. We call it the BCSA. Some of you have heard of CSAs. Well, this is a BCSA. We help churches to buy in bulk from black farmers from down south. And we work with these churches to not only buy the produce that they need, but also we stand in the gap as an organization to help transport that produce from farms down south to the churches up north. It's a powerful program as well. Some might wonder, why do we call ourselves the Black Church Food Security Network? Well, it's quite simple. The Black Church is the most sustainable institution in Black America. Since the late 1700s to this very day, Black churches serve as anchor institutions Places where black folk have long been able to come for support, advocacy, inspiration, and information. This is the place where organizers come to plan their next action. This is the place where the activists come to bring their ideas to the fore so that they might move their campaigns forward. This is the place where young people come to get scholarship money to go to college and earn their degrees. This is the place where people come in the midst of their tragedy and know from the door that they'll get some kind of support in the midst of their hardship. The black church is the most sustainable institution, and it's a durable one at that. How many black churches over the years have been burned to the ground by racist violence? How many crosses have been burned at the front door of black churches by the KKK? How many pastors, preachers, and church folk have been lynched and even shot down in their Bible study classes? How many little black girls have been bombed in Sunday schools because racists could not fathom that black people could organize under their own roof and on their own land. But yet, despite all of these horrific ordeals in our story, every time something happens, the black church just keeps on bouncing back. This is a durable institution. And it also is an institution that has a greater degree of autonomy from the white power structure. It's where black people come and bring our resources together to buy land that we need, to purchase buildings, to have expansions on our property. We have some autonomy, a greater degree of autonomy to pursue our biggest, baddest, and boldest freedom dreams. We are at a place now, family, where many are marching in the streets of the United States. We're at a place where many are crying for justice, where many are raising their voices there might be a better day for our people. And I am one who says, listen, on this new frontier and latest chapter of the black freedom struggle, the black church yet remains a freedom institution when it's at its best. And I implore all those listening to me to find ways 
to support the local black church freedom institution nearest you. For we are clear at this point that if freedom is to come for the masses of black people, it will not come by virtue of the academy. If it is to come, it will not come by virtue of corporate America. But if freedom is to come for our people, and if we are to have the basic ingredients for our freedom already in hand, I do declare that the black church is the space and the place where the movement can continue. I ask all who are listening the same question that God asked me. What is in your hand? And I venture to say that for many of you listening to me right now, you can push the rewind button of your mind and remember the black churches that helped to groom you, grow you, encourage you, and support you. Those churches, many of them are still standing. Maybe they need some help. Maybe they need some support. But with help, support and focus, they can be the same kind of supportive institution for the next generation like it was for your generation. Let's not abandon our institutions of the black church. Let's not leave it by the wayside. The basic ingredients for our freedom, our collective liberation, many of those basic ingredients are found right here at the church. The church kitchen, the church bus, the sanctuary, the computer lab, the multimedia centers, the parking lot, and yes, the land. When you put that all together, it's a powerful concoction that can be a muscle and fuel to all that we dream for ourselves and yes, even for this nation. There's new frontiers and innovation that is needed in the church, no doubt, but it won't happen without us being connected and supportive of these local black institutions that have birthed HBCUs, that have built hospitals, that have established libraries, that have bailed our babies out of jail that helped to bury Big Mama and family members when families had no money. This institution is still here. And if we work together, it can help to transform the material conditions of the masses. Yes, it's a new frontier, but there's an old landmark called the Black Church that can help us even to move forward into the new frontiers of our lived experience. It starts it can start with us growing our own food, but once we figure that out, what else can we do together? How else can we forge ahead in freedom's direction? Those are the kind of freedom dreams that keep me up at night and keep me excited about the frontiers of the future. Thank you. Dr. Brown, thank you for that wonderful presentation. As I listen to what you've done in such a short period of time, I'm reminded, but my grandfather used to tell me that we come into this world with nothing, we leave with nothing, and the only thing we can do while we're here is to have impact. And certainly, uh, if anyone ever raises the question, uh, what can an individual do, what can one person do, uh, do you certainly have plotted uh, that path uh, for them? You show it's been an excellent example. Uh, I also appreciate your comments uh, on the the black church. Uh, the, I think PBS's recent series on that really underscored uh, much of what you have said in terms of the power uh, and the enduring value uh, of that institution. So uh, let me spend some time now, if I might, uh, turning uh, to, to some questions. Um, uh, and let me start uh, with, uh, I have a question portal and hopefully our portal is working uh, this week as the questions come in. But how can black churches advance food justice in our community? And again, how can individuals 
uh, help uh, in that effort because if there's one thing we want to do uh, with all of our discussions is to stimulate individuals from becoming uh, sympath uh, to becoming from becoming sympathizers uh, to advocates uh, to get them moving, uh, doing something other than uh, you know agreeing with you. So tell us uh, uh, again, how can individuals help uh, in that effort? Sure. I think, and thank you so much again for this opportunity. It's been amazing already to be connected with you all. I think that um, one of the things when I talk about Black churches advancing food justice, one of the things that we have to be clear about is that the food system in this country is working exactly as it was designed to work. It is operating precisely how it was designed to. So when you hold that in one hand and you think about the food environments of many of our communities across the country, uh, depending on corner stores, uh, not having grocery stores or ready access or agency with respect to nutrient-rich foods, and then all of the domino effects of that, all of the health challenges that we experience, all of the community uh, issues that we face, when you hold those two together, the food system that we have was designed to work just like it's working. The conditions that we face are an outgrowth of that. I think one of the things that Black churches should do is to recognize that the system that we have will not produce the results that we need with respect to our health and with respect to us having agency to our food environment. And that's where Black churches can come in. Black churches come in right there to begin recognizing that and then begin thinking through how they can bridge the gap. Now, thankfully, you know, black churches have been doing, churches in general have been doing soup kitchens and food pantries for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So food is not necessarily a foreign topic, but the way that we've done it, which is why I love the theme about New Frontiers, the way that we've engaged around food tends to be more on the cultural significant side, and that's wonderful, on the charity side, which has been helpful, but not on the justice side. And so here's an opportunity for Black churches to organize, and I'm so grateful that you mentioned the PBS uh, production on the Black church. I loved every minute of it. I'm so grateful for it. And I think about the ways that our memory of what Black churches have brought to the table in terms of racial uplift Sometimes it's narrow just to the civil rights movement. It's almost like black churches didn't do anything before that period and haven't done too much since. But you and I and many watching know that black churches have been engaged and involved on a number of issues even beyond the civil rights movement. And even before that movement and that time period, farmers, black churches, farming, it was a very close relationship, and I think bringing back to that is going to be very important. You asked about how you can go from being sympathetic to being an advocate. Well, leave it to the Black Baptist preacher to say to those who are watching, do you go to church? <laughs> uh, what church are you connected to? Because I think if persons want to begin getting a lay of the land in terms of what congregations can do, we are very relational in our community. And so we could be an expert out in society all we want to, but unless we are in relationship with the Sunday school teachers, with the pastor, with the trustees and deacons, it can be very hard. So I say the first step is find some kind of way to be in relationship. I'm not even necessarily trying to proselytize in this moment, but I'm saying there's got to be a way to have some type of meaningful connection with the local congregation so you can kind of get a sense of what opportunities and possibilities are present around food and that church. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned some historical roles uh, for the church, and we often speak of churches running uh, food pantries. We don't speak often, or at least I haven't, of churches and their relationship uh, with farmers. And in your instance, with uh, black farmers, is this new or you're telling me that this is of long standing and tell us a little bit more about the relationship between churches and black farmers 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, definitely not new. Not at all. It's it's an ancient connection. It's it's a historic one. Uh, many of those who are watching us now will know that many black churches got started because a black farmer offered up some land for them to build their congregation. Uh, so there's a relationship there all across this country, but particularly in the South. Who had the land? Black farmers had the land. And so when it was time to build the church, oftentimes they gave off some land for that to happen. And so from that point, we've been connected. And then there were certain time, time periods in the year where even the relatives that left the South and went North or went West, they would come home and they would help the farmers with the harvest. We call this in the church homecoming. And we'd have whole services around the homecoming celebration. Um, and it was spiritual and it was agricultural. So those are, those are two examples. And then I'm working on my first book right now to go deeper into this history, because since the 1900s, we have record of pastors and farmers and church leaders and congregations that have created micro food systems, growing the food that they needed, moving it through the church, connecting with local farmers and food business owners, and creating these micro food system hubs. It's really a fascinating story. And in fact, has a tie even to the civil rights movement because during that period when advocates would go south to do organizing, uh, oftentimes they stayed with farmers because that was a safe place to stay. Or farmers are the ones that put up land bail to bail the young activists out of the local jails. Farmers were there. And so black churches, black farmers and movements for justice have been around for a long time, and I'm really grateful to be adding to and extending that tradition today. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question here uh, about, you're talking about your relationship with farmers, black farmers. Black farmers have a whole set of issues and challenges. Uh, yes. And the uh, certainly getting uh, federal assistance. We've seen that highlighted uh, by this president administration about how, how they had been previously uh, neglected. Has your church had the opportunity to get involved in the farmers uh, problems as well as your own food desert problems? You know? So yes, absolutely. Great question. One of the things that I did early on was we had field trips at our church where I would get a charter bus and take our members down south to the farms. I thought it was important that those who left the south go back down to the farm and get their feet on the land in part to develop relationships with black farmers, but also to see farming from their point of view, which leads to your, to your question. I felt like only after my congregation got a chance to really see life from a farmer's vantage point, to really hear them talk about the financial challenges, talk about the injustices in the food system that, that limit and hamper their efforts, only then would I have uh, the ability to organize our congregation to make the farmer's problem their problem and our problem. And so you, you mentioned what this present administration is doing to try to address that. And you'll also know that with those monies that were, this program that was supposed to be providing financial support to black farmers, you'll know that forces organized to stop and halt that program so that those monies do not, you know, it's on hold right now and it's frozen right now as they're trying to work out the legal piece because there are many people who take issue with black farmers getting what they justly deserve and receiving some of the reparative resources as the USDA and the US government has rightly confessed that they have been historic wrongs against this group. 
And so I think organizing local congregations to get involved on the advocacy side, letter writing to elected officials, testifying at hearings, um, in addition to buying from black farmers, it all goes a long way in giving them the support that they need. Thank you. Uh, we have a climate change question yes. uh, that has come in, and it is, how do you see climate change impacting the future of food culture for marginalized people? Such an amazing question. Thank you to whoever asked that, because I think we are in a very, very tenuous situation right now as climate chaos, uh, as I'm calling it now, continues to unravel. I mean, you think about it, we have rising, global rising temperatures, we have glaciers melting, we have the water line of the oceans rising, you have forest fires, droughts, the ocean is on fire in a couple of places, and storms are intensifying. This is a really tenuous and critical moment, and I believe that food sovereignty, and not just food security. And sovereignty, as y'all know, is just a word that points to control and agency. And so historically marginalized communities having greater control over their food system is so paramount right now. I mean, think about the last 12 months or so. Last year, we saw the industrial food system almost be brought to its knees. For the first time in many people's lifetime, they saw their local grocery store losing, having food, having shelves that were getting bare and long lines at the supermarket. Uh, we saw how fragile the industrial global food system is. And for me, I saw the necessity of having micro local food systems that will not collapse just because something's going on in another part of the country. We need a better, just like we saw the grid in Texas shut down electricity because the system and the grid was not uh, adequate to sustain. We need a better food system that's more like a spider web and less like a global uh, one linear kind of line. And so there's a lot of work to be done there, but I'll just say that as these climate change issues continue to intensify, we all know that those who will feel the brunt of it soonest will be historically marginalized communities. So a part of my ministry, I, I kind of feel like Noah. And some of y'all remember Noah from Sunday school. Uh, Noah was instructed by God to build an ark because a flood was on the way. And I feel like in a way, we need to start building an arc around food and energy and the like, because for all of the recycling that you might do and all of the reuse and repurposing that I might do, uh, large corporations and the, the global global corporate scene and countries, it's it's we're going downhill fast. And I don't want to be gloom and doom because there is hope that, but that hope comes in us working together to build the arc that we need to weather the storm uh, that are. Are coming in the next generations and in the next 40 years, not even the next generation, in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Thank you. Um, one of the things I, I learned when I had the opportunity to briefly be a superintendent of schools uh, was that hungry children cannot learn. Mm. Um, and mm -hmm. I used to speak with our nutrition team and I would tell them that you got to feed them up before we can teach them up. It was as simple right. uh, as that. And so what kind of relationship uh, does your network or your church have with the school systems uh, in Baltimore and with respect to nutrition? And then afterwards, I'm going to circle back around and start talking about expanding services beyond nutrition. But let's get to the nutrition sure. Uh, question for sure, absolutely. Yeah, we've had some preliminary conversations with the school system here in Baltimore, um, and we're looking at ways that we might help to pipeline nutrient-rich produce to local schools. Um, so those talks are still underway <clears throat> to help more of our black farmers get some of those contracts, as I mean, you know better than I do about uh, the level of support and resources that goes into feeding all the children in the school system. And I think when school systems uh, through institutional purchasing can be intentional about supporting historically marginalized growers, 
it can go a long way to make sure our children have nutritious food, but also to advance economic justice in the community of farmers right around uh, in their area as well. And so I'm prayerful about how that will continue to unfold. And uh, prayerfully, next time we talk, we can have an update there and I'll be have, able to share some good news there, but we're working on it. Okay, uh, great. Uh, in, that, uh, in a similar vein, uh, one, I think the challenges of the educational system in the United States is in many ways is being asked to do too much. Uh, it's being asked to manage race relations. It's being asked to manage uh, nutrition. Uh, and as you step back and look at it as a system, uh, you also see that uh, the need for social services and other wraparound services are, are clearly there and clearly paramount uh, as well. And so one of the questions I ask of community organizations is, you know, uh, what are you doing uh, with respect to those types of social justice and social services uh, that schools need as well? Great question. Yeah, I, I think I think back to a day and time when I listen to the, my elders and to the seniors of the church, they tell me of a time when they were growing up where their teachers lived on the block where they lived, where the doctor was around the corner, when the pastor was on the uh, the next street over, they talked to me, and this was was not my experience, but I've just been listening. They talked to me about a time when the church was such a hub and the community was such a hub that a lot of those needs that you lifted up was able to be addressed in an easier fashion because people lived together. They knew one another. They The doors were left unlocked. My grandmother tells me of a time when she didn't have to lock her door at night. Uh, and people would just come in and, you know, get what they needed and everybody knew one another. What I'm striving to do is see if we can build on what black churches have already done with respect to education. Black churches already have, like, back-to-school events. They're about to start in the next month or so. Uh, black churches have been sending scholarship funds to help young people through school since the very beginning. So I think we have, I mean, back to that kind of asset-based community development thing and starting with what you already have, Black churches already have a tradition of supporting schools in some ways, but I think based on your comment and question, I think you're exactly right. There's an opportunity to enhance and innovate and build on what we've done so that, for example, pastors and church leaders and deacons see that their pulpit and sanctuary go much further than their four walls. But, but we got to be proactive and pick up the phone and call the principal and say, hey, what do you need? We have to adopt classrooms like businesses adopt highways and say every, every classroom in this, every child in this classroom is going to have all the support, not just materially, but we're going to be here to provide support for the family beyond material things as well. So I think for the, for the rising generation of pastors, I think it's incumbent upon us to stretch our thinking around what the conventional roles of a pastor are and what you know deacons need to do the same thing, trustees, scholarship committee. I just think we have to be proactive. We got to be there, not just for first day of school, but for every day of school, finding a way that we can be in partnership with the needs of those in the building. Great. Uh, let me stay on this aspirational theme because one of the things I listened intently to was how you grew your church's experience into uh, a network. And I, I didn't get from the talk a sense of the scale of that network. And so if you could give me a sense of what that means in terms of number of churches, number of people involved. And, and after that, give me a sense of what your aspirations are uh, for, for this network. Absolutely. We have approximately 50 or so churches that have signed up to be a member of this network, and it's growing rapidly. In the last 12 months, we've seen more growth than our entire five-year history as people saw the challenges with food and health. Our phones are ringing off the hook, and so we expect that number to continue to rise. And also, we have a Black Farmer directory, which has slightly more than that, about 60 to 70 Black farmers on a map so that as people reach out and say, 
hey, I want to support black farmers. Where are they? We're able to direct people to the map to go find the farmer nearest them. And uh, we'll continue to grow that map as well. And so growth is happening on both of those fronts. We have congregations as far west as Omaha, Nebraska. And of course, up and down the east, east coast and the southeast uh, and increasingly in the Midwest, we're growing and popping up everywhere. In terms of what I'm praying for next, um, I'm excited about the ways in which Christian denominations will come on board. So we've had conversations with the AME Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Church at the denominational level. And they are excited about um, partnering with us more officially and having the various arms of their denomination connect with our organization, but greater to a greater degree, advancing uh, health, wealth, and power in our community through food too. And so with all the conferences and events that the AME denomination has, them thinking about nutrition, black farmers, and food sovereignty and health with all of their planning will be a game changer for this mission of our people being healthier and having a greater handle on their food environment. This is not a traditionally historic, I'm sorry, a historically African-American denomination, but the UCC church as well has also, we've been just started some conversations with them about ways that their denomination can connect with us, especially around the food justice angle uh, uh, too. And so I'm, I'm ex excited about what these denominational level conversations might bring, because I think that's where you really get to a level of systematizing what it is that we're doing and ensuring that it can live long beyond us. Uh, because for me, the black church is the most sustainable institution in black America. And so if I'm trying to have something be around for the next seven generations, it just feels right to me to have it planted in the bosom of the black church to allow it to grow and blossom. Well, thank you. One of your uh, motivators earlier uh, was uh, the price of produce uh, you saw in a local store. Uh, yeah. That meant it was there. Right. However, uh, we often read, however, about food deserts uh, mm. where the stores are not there. Now, mm -hmm. do you see that often in the Baltimore area or areas in which you uh, and your network deal? Absolutely. From Detroit to Philadelphia to Baltimore, May Gary, Indiana, major African-American metropolitan cities and areas have the similar dynamic and pattern. And then you put layers of gentrification on top of that in red his, the histories of redlining. Even more so, there are so many communities where we don't even have the stores uh, there, right? And so when I started this organization uh, five, now going on six years ago, um, I did understand it as a food desert too. But then as I kept on journeying, I recognized that distance from a grocery store, which is the USDA's kind of definition for a food desert, distance from the grocery store and the economic level alone was not fully describing what we were seeing in Detroit and Philadelphia and Baltimore and the other cities. Mm -hmm. So this other term started being utilized by those in the food justice space, food apartheid, which really recognizes that distance, yes, but also policies, zoning, development, so many of these factors also contribute as to, to the to the outcome of black communities not having not just access, but even agency over their food environment. So for those communities, as you said, that don't have a store in the neighborhood, they do have a church in the poorest of black neighborhoods in this country. If you don't have nothing else, you'll find the church. Yes. And so our plan is to utilize that. I mean, I've seen some of the maps that have, people have created, maps of every black church in the country. It is mind blowing that in every zip code where you find us, you have a church. And that church can be an institutional hub, an anchor 
for advancing food justice and health and providing wealth opportunities, even if it's the storefront with 50 folks and a tambourine and a washboard. <laughs> By themselves, they might not be able to do much, but you link that storefront up with other churches in the neighborhood and then a network across the country, and now you got something. And so that is a part of our great aspiration, just to get churches working together, no matter their size or locale. Let's figure this out together. Thank you. This has uh, been an excellent discussion about a high, uh, about, excuse me, about grassroots efforts and the networking uh, of those uh, efforts to achieve a clearly stated uh, objective. Uh, and often these, these methodologies are necessary because of hostility in the political uh, establishment or uh, just historical practices. So let me take off the grassroots hat for a moment uh, sure. and ask you to advise this president uh, on what uh, he should do to uh, eliminate food deserts, to assure better nutrition in this country uh, with uh, clearly understanding as uh, many in the Congress will tell you that, you know, presidents have limited power uh, to do things, but they do have the power uh, of the bully pulpit. And we've seen that used both positively uh, and negatively. But what would your advice be to this administration? Yeah, I would start by advising the president to put his support vocally behind the Justice for Black Farmers Act. I think that is a piece of legislation that would really help to ensure that the resources get to black farmers, that historic wrongs are addressed, and that some of the things that local communities need to create their own food systems are put in place. So that's, that's one thing that I would do, uh, I, I would advise. I would also advise the, uh, the USDA has historically not been a, gr a consistently great friend to black farmers. Mm -hmm. And so I think that I would advise this administration to ensure that in a time when so many corporations, businesses, organizations are talking about addressing systemic racism and making commitments to uh, the African-American community, that the USDA be just as vocal and not just vocal, but concrete in doing so. So in terms of shifting resources to local communities and ensuring that it gets in the hands of those who are closest to the problem of food apartheid, because as many of us know, those closest to the problem are oftentimes also closest to the solution. So I would be funneling resources to local people. And I would be, if I was the president, removing the strings that are attached to so many of those financial resources so that local folks have the room and the flexibility to customize the solution based on what they are facing uh, right where they are. And then finally, I'd say the president has audience with corporations that are creating and developers and real estate groups that are um, extending legacies of redlining in this country. I mean, I, you're an your background is education, so you'll know. I've read a report some years ago that said the public school system in this country is just as segregated, if not more so, than it was before Brown v. Board. And I think that the president has an opportunity to use his bully pulpit to talk to real estate developers and planners, trade associations and corporations to be active, not just around Juneteenth or Black History Month, but to shift policies within their organizations so that we're not continuing the housing crisis with the racist bent but that we are truly manifesting equity beyond the sound bites. Thank you. That, that was a, a, a great answer. And, uh, you know, it pains me to try and understand why your answer isn't easily uh, implemented. Uh, yeah. the, the focus on getting resources to the local level is, has always been a Republican focus. Uh, yes. Having control at the local level has always been a Republican uh, focus. Uh, you know, what you 
what you, your suggestion was not for a giant or massive uh, federal program. And, and again, it pains me that the, the politics are such that, that we cannot implement uh, these types of solutions in this country. Well, I don't want to end on a, uh, a dour note. I, I do want to thank you uh, for your time. I, I thought your ideas were stimulating. The only one I took any exception to was devoting any part of your land to the growing of okra. Uh, but other than that, I, uh, uh, again, I, my, my mother forced me to eat that. And so I, <laughs> I don't have a great place in my heart for it. But I, let me commend you uh, for your enthusiasm. Let me commend you uh, for your organizing uh, ability and for your ability to take uh, an idea, uh, to develop the idea, uh, and to spread it to others. And that, to me, is the true hallmark uh, of a leader. And so on behalf of the African American Heritage House here uh, at Chautauqua, on, ha on behalf of the institution, we want to thank you for spending time uh, with us here today. Uh, that will complete our program for today. Uh, we'll have yet one more stimulating program uh, next week. I'd like to thank all uh, who joined. I'd like to thank all who have supported us uh, in the past and continue to do so uh, at this point in time to allow us to bring you programs uh, such as the one we've done today. Uh, and with that, we will sign off. Thank you very much. CHQ Assembly is made possible through the collaboration and innovation of Chautauqua Institution's full-time and part-time staff, seasonal staff, and many volunteers, as well as participants like you, whose engagement, gifts, and subscriptions sustain our mission.